So on March 1st, the documentary Biggie, I Got a Story to Tell was released on Netflix. Who is Christopher Wallace, the notorious B.I.G. to you? Um, one of my best friends. Um, when he was like 14, I was 17. We, we started calling each other cousins from since then. So, What was it like growing up with him when you all were young? Um, we got into a lot of like a lot of trouble, so you know it was fun though, like at, because it was it was always jokes, you know that was that was one of our things, like we we crack jokes all day, you know, so um, it was just fun, enlightening, because like both of us was like sponges for like certain stuff, so. Once we learned certain stuff, we was, oh, yo, we, we was excited, you know. Right. What are some of those things that you and Big were into that maybe most people wouldn't expect that you all would be interested in? Um, like, well, they saw the drawing, like, as far as drawing, um, like, he wasn't... He wasn't as nerdy as I was because I was in anime and stuff like that, like heavy um, comic books, um, fantasy novels and stuff like that. Like he wasn't as, he didn't go as far as that with me, but we shared certain stuff. Like we was into cartoons and stuff like that. But you got to remember, he, we was still teenagers though. So, you know, we still was watching cartoons and stuff like that. But, you know, some of the more nerdy stuff he wasn't. But then he was into some of the stuff. So, cause that was the connection. It was like how, how kind of different we were as a, as opposed to like everybody around us, you know. Gotcha. So, was it just that from you all coming from different environments in comparison to everybody else that you all grew up around? Uh, no, nah, nah, because it was a lot of people that that had the same like a lot of the same experiences. Cause we, like we was in a um for black people a culturally diverse area. You know, you had a lot of islands. Um, American blacks, um, blacks from the Caribbean, the, the Africa, from all over. So, you know, it was diverse in that. But, um, I don't know. Probably at that time, it was kind of different because even though we had like we was on the cusp of being nerdy, but we was doing a lot of other stuff. So it was just like the environment that we happened to be in around the people at that time because we had the people on the other spectrum that we were still like we could be hang out and cool with but for the people that we were all around all the time it was different because like they might not do like be into some of the stuff we into so we'll see stuff that they don't see and we'd be laughing like we had a lot of private jokes we like we see stuff you know, we had a lot of private jokes. We would be sitting to the side laughing at a lot of stuff that dudes didn't understand what we were laughing at. So, you know, it was that was that was the connection too. And then like everybody that we ended up bonding with, like my man O Rest in Peace, my man D Rock, um, Cheek, we all it was all of us like after a while, everything else outside of us was like we had private jokes on everything. So you know, we had our own, you know, you people in little groups, they develop their own little language as opposed to everybody else. So now they got their stuff that they could talk about. And everybody else is oblivious. So we did a lot of that, though. That was our like one of our main things, our private jokes and stuff like that. And just, you know, especially at, at that time, you know, hip hop was was young. So we was into that. And we thought we was just like the the ultimate hip hop, you know, so we always spoke on that. And that was like, that, that, that was one of the biggest connections too, you know, so. In the past, I've heard you refer to Big as your brother. How did you all go about showing brotherly love to each other? I mean, just being there for each other. It's like, you know, when, when I met Big, um, I was seven years. My my mother was already diagnosed with cancer. So, you know, he like we'll have 
hard to hard talk. I, Cause I, we would talk. It was a, I, we would talk, and I would be telling them about my mom's being sick, and like you know, I'm I'm like seeing like her, cause my mom's was robust. And then I'm seeing her, I could use it, like I I was able to carry her from the living room to her bedroom, just like, and it was nothing. I was 17, so so we used to talk and, and, and stuff like that. So just being there for each other, you know, like. Actually, when my mom's passed, his mother took me in. That's how I started living with him. Like, me, him, and O lived in the house with him and his mother. And she allowed us to come in there just off of him. So, that's how I was, you know. Got you. So, can you share about that defining moment when you knew Big had made it? Um, I think when he got the, um, the unsigned hype. That's when, like me. That's when I like me and O, like we knew right then. It was like because Big always had the charm. Like no matter what, even when we was you know hustling and, and, and selling drugs on the block, he had a certain amount of charm with everybody. Like you know, we all have our own law, but Big was able like he make everybody around laugh. You know, cause he like he was popular like that in a sense, like in our neighborhood already. So once I knew he got the exposure, I was like, yo. And to me, he was always the nicest. You know, as far as rapper, he was always like the best rapper I heard. Because you know, at the time, it, like if if somebody my age, um, say they never wanted to be no rapper. Nine times out of ten, they lie. Everybody was like, had little rap books and all that. So everybody was like, and then, you know, I was doing it, and like he's three years younger than me. Once I found out he was better than me at that time, I was cool. Like I was, yo, I stick to basketball. I will play basketball. I'm good. You know, but you know the ego is like, right. man, nah, this little dude ain't gonna be busting my ass and <laughs> and rap. Nah, I'm cool. I'm gonna play basketball and stick to that. So you know. It was that, but just just the um, just us being for each, being there for each other. You know what I mean? Like he go through it, I'm there. You know, if O go through, it, any one of us go through it. Cause my man O had um, he had asthma and he had epilepsy, so he he would have bad asthma attacks. So we at the hospital going to see him when he was going through his little things with the bad asthma attack and and the epileptic attacks. So you know, just you know. Like I said, you know, his mother took me in when I was, what, 19? So. What are some major misconceptions that you realize people have about the documentary or about Junior Mafia um, or the lives involved um, to give space for the docu documentary to exist? Mm. I, I don't, like, I've been gone, so I, I, I don't see any of any of like the misconceptions people see because I haven't been I haven't been around people to like hear any of their mis like misconceptions. So um I don't know. I can't think of anything off my off the top of my head that I that I can think of that people like think about as far as big now, as far as me, everybody just think I was some mean dude that's up and they don't even know like I crack jokes all day like I, I don't even and but I'm I'm usually to myself so they probably don't you know even when we in a group together I'm usually to the side because I don't like I said I don't like the crowds and stuff like that so I usually find somewhere to get real small and stay out the way but you know when we together I'm joking like on like naturally every day when I'm around people that I know I'm 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 joking you know even if, even in in something serious and that's one thing about that's probably some uh, miss they don't realize like even like in our worst times like we could be going through something somebody's gonna crack a joke like somebody in us it's like just to ease the tension and that the, like that's just how we work like we always in Yeah, that's probably it. Because most people see 
like the camaraderie, the closeness of of everybody's like, especially after all these years, like they would they would say, yo, little C's and yo, y'all together. It's like, you know, so they see it, it, that's not really a surprise now, you know, as much as people see how much everybody just joked a lot, you know, how we just cracked jokes. They probably saw it more in the documentary. They start, they saw, they probably saw more of um, our camaraderie as far as cracking jokes and stuff is that concerned. But, you know, that's probably a misconception because they probably just thought we was just all, yeah, no, I, I, you know. I got you. Um, so now, now you're the OG. You're the big homie. What are some things that you wish someone would have told you or influenced you to do as young Seif before Sea Gutter was bred? Um, man, them, them, them brownstones, them dollar brownstones back in the days. Like, like when we first start hustling. And if I would have knew we could have did this instead of buying some crack, they were selling dollar homes. At the dollar home, this is a time. This is how our neighborhoods got gentrified too, because they were selling the dollar homes, and 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 the, um, you know, the Europeans and the Jews, they was just buying it up. You know what I'm saying? And Pete, they still doing it now. Like they don't have the dollar homes, but they they offering people. Really peanuts in this larger scheme of things, but the people think they selling their house for something because a lot of times they they parents bought it when it was at a cheaper price, so they thinking that it's not worth it as a because of the neighborhood. So that's mm -hmm. how they. But yeah, they had a lot of dollar home, and I'm just thinking it's like man, six. What was the check? Six six something six sixty. So, and I'm just thinking how many dollar homes, dollar brownstones I could have bought for the SSR chip. Wow. And with the credit, you know, the stuff that I know now, and, and it's like an afterthought now, it's like, wow, if I would have knew that at 18, like I could have owned like 10, 11 buildings easily. Right, right. In a conversation before you had told me about your volunteer history before COVID with a program for youth that are wrapped up in the juvenile system. Um, can you share a bit about that? Oh, yeah. Um, first, I want to give a shout out to um, Jada Kiss and my man, John, because Jada Kiss introduced me to Giant. Um, Giant got a um, program called Giant Thinking. He goes and um, we it's, it's, it's basically a, a fitness it's fitness, but it's wrapped into, you know, speaking with the youth. So we would go in and work out with the youth, but then, you know, just give our life experiences and, and tell them what the mission statement is for John thinking, you know, um, and um, just give them our experiences, hoping they, you know, take from our experiences and just, you know, the things that we teach in John thinking as far as discipline and, because John thinking is basically they want you to think before you do any action, you know. And it sounds like it's simple, but yeah, it ain't it, it ain't for cause, because I know I was that I was that young dude that I was so you know just from experience we would break it down. I was like yo, I know it sounds as simple as it is, but bro, just you just gotta look at the broader impact that that it's gonna have that that decision is gonna have. Because I always break it down as like, yo, um, us as black men, um, we the protectors of our family. And I always ask them, like, you got little sisters, brothers, you know, younger, you know? And they'll be like, yeah, I was like, all right, when you in here, you can't protect them. So anything that goes on out there, they don't have no protection from the protector. You the protector. So if you ain't here, because I, I take away all the, um, you know, all the other things. I just give it give it to them. It's like, all right, you know, I'm, I'm coming from a standpoint of what it really is. If you're not there to protect them, then anything can happen. So that should be your main focus is like your family. So we think about, all right, because it's the same thing with me. I thought about all the stuff with my daughter that I did materialistically but look how much time I was away from. 
So that didn't, that didn't help. All the stuff I gave her, that those clothes and all of that, and the computer got old. After a while, you got to update it. The clothes got old. She couldn't wear the clothes no more. She had to get new clothes. I'm in jail. So where's she going to get that from? You know what I'm saying? Who, who she going to get when, who she going to cry on when her boyfriend, you know, her first little love, break her heart or whatever, like she can't come to. So it's little things like that and I break it down to them. So, you know, just giving them a little experience from, 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 from a standpoint of an individual that spent a lot of time in jail and, you know, and I always tell them like, yo, you know, you know where I was at when Big got killed? Jail. When my man O got killed, jail. When this happened to me, I was in jail. You know, a lot of everything, a lot of stuff that bad that happened to me, I was in jail. You know what I'm saying? So, I, I and I give it to them, like I tell them, imagine how that impacts you on a mental on the mental stage, because now you're not even there. To, like you gotta grieve, but you're in a situation, you're in a controlled environment where you can't show any form of weakness. So, like I, I, I give them the full spectrum of what is like. This is what you're gonna have to go through when you make these decisions. So, if you thinking the whole thing out, then it's gonna be easier. So, you know. So definitely, I heard the part of uh, where you all focus on fitness. Uh, where Were there any other things that you were able to do or utilize to help them with working with their own egos so that their egos didn't really have so much control over them? Um, yeah, because I told them everything that, you know, all the, all the situations I went through was ego. Because, like, when I, when I caught my Fed case, it was, oh, this dude talking like, uh... That was my ego because I already knew what I was capable of doing, but I allowed somebody what they saying and how I viewed them to affect my actions. So that's your ego. Mm -hmm. I was like, everything you got into was your pride and your ego. Are there any stories or interactions that you had with the group? Um, that stand out to you or have stuck with you over the years? Um, where the most is, I saw like three of the young homies come home. And I didn't see them when they came home, but they contact me when they came home. Like, and I was like, at this time, I was doing the program, but I had a, I had a um, regular civilian job because I was on federal paper. So, um, couple of them said, like, yo, I'm trying to, you know, and I gave them um, applications to that and told the people that, you know, I was like, yo, I got some young, young dude, been in a little trouble, you know, and um, I put them in. Now, I don't know if they actually got the job because when I saw them, you know, I didn't, like, I got their number, they didn't call me back. You know, young dudes, they, but they actually got to the street and I saw them a couple of times not like just the one time but i saw him a couple of times each time i saw him you know they still out there so i don't i hope hoping they hopefully they not you know they staying out of trouble but they out there you know what i mean and just them acknowledging yo like yo they they reached out and i had an impact on you know whatever they was doing you know what i'm saying i still got like it's three of them that always call me. They call me from time to time. I'm not gonna say every day, but like they might call me every two weeks or something. Like, yo, big homie, what's good? What you got? Uh, and I ask them how they doing. They staying out of trouble. So you know, that's the best thing for me because you know, and these are some of the little dudes that was like, wow. But I would like I would check them, but not in a like try to like debone, but like. Just tell them, like, yo, bro, all right, you talking all of that, but this is going to happen. This is going to happen. Bro, I was the same little dude. That's what I would explain to you. I was like, yo, no older dude could tell me nothing when I was older. But I, this is the same thing I told him. I was like, yo, all of them were smart, and I used to tell them. I was like, yo, bro, you smart, but you want to act tougher 
than your intelligence. You want to, you know, you want to, why would you make use of the physical when you don't have to? So, I, so they will always be battling me because I knew they were smart. You know what I mean? So just them. And I would tell them, I was like, yeah, you don't think about it after I'm gone. Like I come here, like I might not come to the same unit every day, but I'm, I'm, I'm at the jail every day. So I was like, yo, I'm coming. I, I'm, I'm here every day. So it don't matter. You're going to see me. You're going to hear the same stuff. But when you go in your cell, it's going to hit you because it did the same thing to me. So that's all I was telling them. You know, just, yeah, it, it, it's going to reach you for the dudes that have the intelligence and, 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 and it's sit. Everybody got to be introspective at one time of the day. That's got to make your heart just like swell knowing that you were able to positively impact their lives like that. Yeah, 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 definitely. Like that makes me like just I, like I'm a person I enjoy other people like enjoying. Like that's that's just one like with me like going out there enjoying if I go out with my homies and we going out to party, like my enjoyment is seeing them. Cause like I'm the oldest. So that's my enjoyment. It's like, all right, they all having a good time. We good. And then I'm happy. You know what I'm saying? So I'm, I'm that's the type of individual I am. So. Um, what are your thoughts on mental health in the black community? Is mental health something that black people should pay attention to? Or is it just another popular fad? Um, they definitely, definitely should pay attention to their um, mental health, but it's also faddish too. Cause a lot of people like talking about it, but you know, a lot of people that talk about like the mental health thing, like they don't actually is like, I uh, yeah, but it's always a, but yeah, but I'm cool. You know what I mean? It's like, all right, then you not really with them because everybody got issues. If you were out, to me, everybody that's of African descent in America got issues. You got to. Just in my, you know, in my from my perspective, you got to have issues because this is not this is not normal. Our interactions are not normal. It's abnormal to me. Where you know. People, you know, got to live the way they live on a normal basis. Because it's, it's, I don't think it's too many black people that come out of the house that don't think about, all right, is the police going to mess with me one part of the day? Or is I'm going to have some crazy white person say something retarded to me out of left field of me this day? So, you know, and it's a constant barrage. This is like from when you were a baby, like little kids get it from as it. So you got to have issues. What are some things that are considered to be cool today that were like corny when you and Big were coming up? Cool today that was corny then. I don't know because it's just like I because we looked at like the older dudes from us like they I and I'm not even gonna say corny but they was like old school so I know a dude was it would look at me now it's like that's one of them old school dudes like he's from the 90s like or something like that so they looking at me like I'm weird so I already know that's how that goes so um I don't know you have this beautiful brand that I'm so excited about called Balagoon Clothing. Um, you know, things that warriors wear. Um, what inspired the start of the brand? Um, the inspiration was, well, um, we always like dressing, like, you know, so that's, that was one of the things, it's like, yo. As, as long as I can remember, clothes has been like a part. Like that's 
it, that went hand in hand with music with me. You know, like dressing and, and, and that was like a part of that was like a part of my life. So, you know, I always liked fashion and the name, which is my is it's my name, but it's also a title. It's a Yoruba name. Was it's basically a warrior, but it's the top warrior. So it's basically a general. So um I guess for the clothing lines, the inf the inspiration was when I was in the feds, I worked in Unicor. So we worked in, that's the factory. So in federal prison, I would um, sometimes alter my pants, shirt, to make it, you know, more tailored. So um, my, 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 my uniform always looking neat. Boom. And, you know, I would do sweat, I would, you know, do sweat suits, and everything, so I my joints would look tell us it's like me and the me and the homeboy would always talk about fashion. So he was like, "Yo, what you want to do?" I was like, "Yo, man, I probably want to do like a clothing line or something." It's like, "Yo," so you know, it started there, and then I got transferred to another jail, and I was getting. The Warriors tattooed on my abdomen. I have Shango, Eshu, Oshosi, and Ogun. So that was getting tattooed on my abdomen. But I had a spot there. And I was thinking, it's like, yo, what could I do that could match the theme? So I was like, all right. My name. But I said, all right, my name. Cause it all factors in. So when I got the tattoo, I drew, I, I sketched the sword and the shield. The sword is really, I, I made, put the sword on there because a lot of people don't know that Africa was the first place swords was made. So I just wanted to throw that little, that out there. So when a person asks me about it, I can explain, you know. So the sword and spear on the African shield um, with my name. And then that was just, Something was like to put right there to make the tattoo. Man, I was like, all right, this is like my little crest that, you know. So when I was getting it, a homeboy came in the cell when I was getting it. He was like, bro, remember you was talking about the clothing line? There go the logo right there. And that's how, you know, and from there, that's how, that's where it's been. That's been etched in my, you know, my skull, well, really on my body. Now, that's on my body from then, but, you know, the logo is not the exact same as the tattoo, you know what I mean? But, you know, that's basically where the general idea came from. That is such a dope concept. Dope concept. Where where are you planning to carry your brand in the future? Um, ho Hopefully it's, it's, it's worldwide, you know. That's where I'm gonna be working. That's what I, I'm working towards, you know, for you know everybody from you know from the continent all through the diaspora having like one item at least, you know, a t-shirt, a hat, something, you know what I mean? And, and and because I just want us to have that same reverence for our own that we seem to have for everybody else. So. What are some items that you offer as a part of your brand right now? Um, I got tech sweatsuits, the tech fleece sweatsuits, t-shirts, hats, hoodies, regular sweatshirts. Um, yeah. What are you looking to do in the future when it comes to uh, maybe some concepts that you have for your brand? Um, one of the concepts is um my. Uh, Black History Month is every month where I have a specific warrior on the front. And, you know, you'll have a little history on that and they can go to the website and, you know, basically get links to where they can learn more about it. Because I want to give you information on our people, our heritage too, at the same time. So they will be able to go to the website find links on the computer or books that they want, they might want to read. What is a day in a life for you like now? Um, 
ba- basically, um, and I hate to say it, it's more shit. It's more like um, me being in jail. Cause I like I, I pattern my day. I get up. I get on. I do the clubhouse. I get on our clubhouse entrepreneurs room at ten o'clock. I'm like, you know, and at the same like, I might do my yoga at the same time. I might be working out at the same time, and then when I'm done with like all doing this time, I'm either working out, making something to eat, doing my um yoga, um, on my computer, learn like tapping in as we're actually conversing on on Clubhouse. Then I go out and if I have any sales, I go and, you know, because the majority of my sales come from person to person as opposed to online, you know. Um, so if I got any sales to, um, if I got any deliveries like in, the, in, in my neighborhood or if I got anything I got to ship that from online sales, I'm doing that and just basically, um, you know, um, just doing that and trying to just basically it's something it's something concerning business all day. Or I'm going to see my babe, my two babies, like my daughter and my granddaughter, and my grandson coming. So congratulations, yeah. congratulations. Yeah, we it was last week's last Saturday. She got her gender reveal. I I knew already. I was having a little bottle of wine. So yeah. gotta be proud of that. Gotta be proud of that. Yeah, definitely. So when it comes to you, you mentioned um, Clubhouse and the Therapy for Entrepreneurs group. Have you felt that Clubhouse has been beneficial to you? Yeah, more than any more than any other app, personally, because you're able to converse with somebody and tap in, and you're able to you know know get some information from them that can actually help you, as opposed to y'all. I'm gonna take this picture. I'm, taking a picture with this dude somewhere and you know yeah that's that's fine but you know me actually getting input from people and them you know not just me asking questions but somebody giving me input on what they think about an idea that I might have whether it's feasible or not you know because we get these you know we get these groups and we actually have conversation as opposed to you know people just yapping you mentioned that you're on uh, some various social media platforms. Where can people find you? Um, like if you want it, for example, if they wanted to book you for a speaking engagement or book you for an interview or just to keep keep up on what's going on with you. Well, um, I got two Instagram pages. Um, one is Real Mafia Sea Gutter and one is Bottle Going Clothing. And I'm on Twitter as Real Mafia Sea Gutter. Um, Facebook page, Seep Jackson. And then I have one, Bottle Goon Clothing. Um, yeah. And then also, what's the website that people can go to to um, purchase from Bottle Goon Clothing if they'd like yeah, to? Yeah, it's BottleGoonClothing.com. All right. Well, Gutta, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I really, really appreciate this. This has been great. Oh, no problem. Thank you. Thank you.